The chairs. So thank you for coming this morning. Um, I know from uh, previous openings at um, Founders Symposium that people um, come in at various times and um, not so much first thing in the morning. So I especially want to welcome those of you who got here for the start um, and braved the early time and perhaps um, still some of the rush hour traffic. Um, you know, Founder Symposium is a really important event for CIS. And I think one of the things that is perhaps distinctive about the school is that we're always thinking back to the start and to what the goals and aspirations were that led to the creation of CIS and then what that means in the contemporary context. So, um, First of all, I want to acknowledge that Bauman Charzi is not here today, and he has been part of the guiding spirit um, in moving Founders Symposium um, every year. Bauman, of course, graduated from CIS. Um, he continues to teach here and to work with dissertation students. Um, uh, but the archivist position is one that we no longer have. When I talked to him about Founders Symposium for this year, um, I said one of the things that I wanted us to do was to kind of look back at the beginning and then raise the question, what does integral philosophy mean in the context of the world that we live in now? Um, how does it get applied? How do we think about the issues that are important now? Um, as compared to the issues that were important in 1968. So I, I want to take a moment and think back to 1968. It's a year I remember really well. Um, seems like just yesterday because it's the year that I actually started graduate school at Berkeley. Um, so the experiences of that year are um, totally part of my kind of founding psyche. And in 1968 was described, has been described as a year of protests. Um, that certainly was my experience of it, of protesting a lot. Um, protesting about the Vietnam War, protesting about civil rights, um, Martin Luther King Jr. and Robert Kennedy's assassinations that I um, can still visualize without even needing to close my eyes. Um, and that in, it was a time of deep fragmentation in terms of this country, in terms of the world, and a time when a lot of different people were creating new educational institutions. So lots of experimentation around higher education in um, primarily focused on how do we help students learn deeply, how do we make education relevant, how do we think differently about what our goals were in higher education. And fast forward 48 years later, most of those schools are long gone. CIS continues, and I think part of the reason that CIS continues comes out of the strength of the integral philosophy on which it's built. That um, the idea that um, fragmentation, both internally to ourselves, fragmentation in our world, is very much a part of our lives, and that there are ways to think about wholeness, to hold wholeness up as a, as a goal and an aspiration. Um, is something really essential that we need to do. I think it means it meant different things in 1968 than it means now, but it's also still a way um, to provide the answers. So in 1968, when I was demonstrating at Berkeley around um, civil rights, our goal was to bring women and African Americans into the academy. Um, and um, Looking back now, it's like that's that's all. That's all we were thinking about. 
But the reality was that even in the sociology department, 1968 was the first year that the Berkeley sociology department brought in more than one woman and more than one African-American. So it seemed like a big task. Now we're talking about intersectionality. How do we hold all of those different identities that we have in terms of in ourselves and how do we intersect with other people who also hold these multiple um, you know, identities, um, some of which we can readily understand and some of which we can't readily understand. And so it's always seemed to me that part of what um, integral philosophy helps us understand is the places in which the intersections, those holes, the places in which the intersections don't happen quite readily, whether we're talking about bringing together different disciplines or we're talking about how do we understand our own selves or how do we understand somebody else or how do we work with other people, that it's at those, those awkward intersections that it gives us a way to think about it. So um, we talk about um, Dr. Haridas Chowdhury as though he stepped out a moment ago, and we are expecting him to come back into the building. And of course, we know that that's not the case. But I think every time any of us looks at or thinks about the mission of this school, that it leads you back to the things that he wrote about and thought about as he was creating the school. And what I think is quite remarkable about those writings is that they are, in fact, as relevant today as they were when he wrote them so many years ago. So CRS is very, very, very fortunate that, in our, that we had such a good founding that in, um, in the, the philosophy and in the, the persona that really founded it in, in Hari Das and Dina Chowdhury, that we had people of vision that would stand us in good stand, good stand even 48 years later. And that's quite remarkable. So I'm happy to welcome you here and all of the people who will be coming in and out as um, the day progresses. And, um, and, I, and I look forward to hearing people's ideas about how the, um, the founding ideas um, help us understand our contemporary world. So thank you. And now I'm going to turn the microphone over to Robert McDermott, who is our, who is so many things, who is our um, president emeritus, who is um, professor of philosophy, cosmology, and consciousness, and chair of that program and of philosophy and religion, and who is also our Vice President for Development. So a man of many, many roles and many talents and lots of intersectionality. So Robert. Thank you, Judy, uh, and for um, a warm introduction. Uh, I was thinking to myself, and Judy was ticking off, I do this, I do that. I was going to say, yeah, but that's nothing. I knew Dr. Chaudhary, which is my major <laughs> bragging uh, uh, claim. Um, and uh, it's for someone who believes in karma and destiny and um, sort of, um, I don't know that I have a astral relationship to uh, Dr. Chaudhary, but I absolutely have a mental, emotional, um, biographical relationship that I have had since uh, I met uh, Aridas and Bina in uh, 1970 on my way back from um, the ashram and Oroville. And so uh, thank you, Judy, for bringing in the memory of 1968. Uh, I was not in protest in 68. We had 
the one trial than <laughs> writing my dissertation. And uh, but I was a, a this faculty advisor to SDS, uh, Students of Democratic Society, uh, which did not help my um, orientation toward radical thinking. Because when I went to the national conference with a, about 20 students, college students, I found out that the people giving these fiery speeches were attacking Shakespeare and learning and all kinds of things to which I was devoting my life. So um, these, these, when something flares up, like happened in the late 60s, really the whole second half of the 60s, 66, 70, and then 72, and then et cetera, and now, um, it's never simple. There's always reasonably good uh, positions that oppose each other. And so I was disappointed <laughs> that they were attacking Shakespeare, but I was also totally with them in attacking uh, dead knowledge and old notes and um, education without relevance to contemporary life. So I could go in and out of the room, etc. And we still can do that. And so here I'm, I uh, uh, agreed to speak on uh, the spiritual mission of CIIS, but uh, it's obviously in the context of the intense concerns for social justice. So in a way, my task, uh, I, which, I, which I hope I'll succeed, uh, is to put the two together. To the extent that they are uh, separated, I want to, uh, I want to argue. <laughs> I want to say, no, you know, this is actually not what we're trying to do. They don't belong separate, they belong together. But they often appear separate. In fact, uh, I, I, I mean, I have this very strong commitment to this picture of where and how they overlap and, and, and how creative and positive that is and how the uh, spirituality without social justice, which is available, is it, in the spirituality tradition, there's lots of um, uh, obliviousness to social justice. There's also a lot of uh, quite intense social justice, which I support, I think we all support, and yet I think could go deeper and uh, have some uh, added positive qualities if it had a, a, a spiritual dimension. Right. Now, that's a hard task for us all to hold together what our society tends to pull apart, but that's what I'm here to talk about in relation to the California Institute of Integral Studies. So, uh, you know, Judy was talking about the founding, and I do believe that we have, our institution has been well founded uh, by two people of vision, of practicality, of integrity, of you know, Haridas deep learning, Bina of amazing practicality and good, clear sense. Um, so that's a wonderful start. And I think that it's a lot like a family that we hardly ever completely outgrow our beginning in our family, positively, negatively, or more likely a mix. And I don't want us to outgrow that. At the same time, I'm, I, having followed the career of people like uh, Scalia, I am not originalist. All right, I am not saying because it was in the original founding, it must be preserved. Uh, that I think is a trap. And we know that the constitution written by uh, landed white males, mostly Christian or sort of Christian, uh, is not adequate to the 21st century. And the justices who think that it is, uh, usually uh, commit themselves and us to grave injustices. So I don't want us to be originalists in that sense. At the same time, this is complicated, at the same time, just as I think America has a biography, an interior biography, a kind of a karmic uh, destiny to bring something strong uh, into the world, which it does rather poorly, but it nevertheless is trying to do. If you clock the whole history, you'll see it's actually making a lot of progress uh, after you know, two, three, two and a half centuries of injustice. Um, now, at least, there's an awareness of the injustice and some amount to offset it. Um, that, of course, has been going on for a longer time, but it's very complicated, as I think you'll agree. Well, our uh, institution uh, is in a situation where social justice is an absolute imperative, and we can't be uh, committed to a spiritual mission at the expense of social justice. 
That said, I think there is something in our biography, in our spiritual biography, in our inner life together, living off the original founding and with all the hard years thereafter and then better years and better years, there is something there that we should be covering. And I want to call it the spiritual mission, all right? And we can do social justice without it, but I think if we do just social justice with it, we will do the social justice better, and we will preserve a mission which is rare and special, also quite fragile, or vulnerable, vulnerable, right. Okay, so what is, what is that mission? Well, in the case of Sri Aurobindo, who is the one who sent Dr. Chaudhry, a young professor in, um, in, ben in Bengal, uh, to uh, join uh, uh, Louis Gainsborough and uh, Frederick Spiegelberg and Alan Watts and some others in 1951. Um, there, Sri Aurobindo's and Haridas's vision of integral the name of Sri Aurobindo's philosophy and yoga and spirituality, that is based on the Bhagavad Gita. Knowledge, the transformation of knowledge, action, love, meditation. And in addition to the teachings in the Bhagavad Gita, evolution of consciousness. So it's those practices, disciplines, ways of living in relation to everything evolving. Maybe not so well, but evolving. All right, that was what Sri Aurobindo and thereafter Haridas Chaudhary meant by integral. That's not the name he gave to the school. This name integral came into the school in 1981, uh, uh, not in order to uh, sort of undo the mission, but to use the name that uh, Sri Aurobindo and Dr. Chaudhary used, and also because it was a good way of signaling East and West. So by the 1980s, there were two important meanings of integral. The, the, yoga, the disciplines of the, of the uh, Bhagavad Gita, knowledge, action, love, meditation. Some people say three, but it's really four. And then evolution of consciousness, but also increasingly then East and West. Although by the 80s, the West was growing much faster than the Asian, much, much faster. Okay. Then, probably sometime around the 90s, I remember noticing it when I was here in the 90s, that uh, people started to refer to integral as body, mind, and spirit, which is quite a good thing. I mean, you, can quite, you can't quite put them onto uh, knowledge, action, love, but they have some similarities, and uh, it was a time of increasing awareness of uh, somatics, of uh, the... Um, of the downside of some kinds of spirituality, which were anti-body, also some kinds of religion that were anti-body. Um, and so the whole effort to claim the, and uh, celebrate the, um, the importance uh, of, of the whole physical world, beginning with uh, the body, but uh, the human body, but also evolution, that then became quite a wonderful trio. So I'm not choosing among these. These are all good ways of, of thinking about integral. At the present time, I think very similar to 68, but with a different quality to some extent, shall we say. Um, we are again in this time of what is the relevance? Uh, what about people who are suffering? What about poverty? What about war? Uh, what about our uh, horrendous uh, national political situation? Uh, and so social justice is saying to the, our spiritual mission, to our institution, uh, what do you have to show? What can you bring to the table, what, where is your relevance? And so I want to say, the relevance has to do with depth. It has to do with depth and height. It has to do with foreground and uh, a background and foreground. In other words, it has to do with a more vast context. And it has to do with paying attention to the subtle, to the, um, to, to messages, to signals, to, uh, uh, I would say, messages that are not obvious, that require attention, require uh, humility, that require uh, reverence in the face of complexity, in the face of contrast or conflict, in the face of, of uncertainty, uh, which, of course, all institutions, almost all institutions of higher education are dealing with. We are dealing with the uncertainty of uh, financial struggle 
40% of the institutions of higher education did not meet their budget this past year. We are one of them. So there are deeds that have to be done that require courage and will be met with protest and disagreement. That's a spiritual, it's a social challenge. It's a political, psychological challenge. I'm suggesting it's a spiritual challenge as well, that we have the humility and the, the sensitivity to deal with these issues that affect people's lives. So as we all know, just about everybody here is here with some sense of, of ideal or journey, some sense of, of the specialness of the community, and to be asked to leave is very painful, very painful. Uh, they may be great in a year, but right now it's it's painful. And those of us who are here uh, feel their pain uh, and all of that is in the air. And so the question that arises kind of automatically, well, what is this spiritual stuff doing for us? Well, spiritual stuff is, is actually work. It's actually uh, not, so, it's not a low hanging fruit. It's, it's a task. It's paying attention. It's being respectful of complexity. It's trying to draw from the mission in a non-ideological, non-contentious um, way. It's saying, thank you, Haridas and Bina, for giving us such a great start. And what you did was this amazing act of courage and vision, clearly not knowing where you were going. How could you? It's not, you're not supposed to start a school in 1968. You just didn't feel like not a good idea. And the others, lots of them that were started at the same time are not here, all right? So be grateful to that and then be modest about the future that we hold to the inner quality of our community, of our mission, of our founding, affirming our seven commitments and be open to the future. We're not originalists, we're evolutionary. We're building on the past, the next step we absorb the past for the next to the next, not in a radical kind of break, but in a way that is gentle in, in making the next step. So I want to just remind you, um, uh, I want to remind you of our uh, commitments, which are quite uh, specific about what we're supposed to be doing. We have uh, this, these are, they were called uh, ideals, now they're called commitments. We're really uh, committed to them. So it's integral ways of, of learning. That's not true everywhere. Uh, most of the academy, highly specialized, divided uh, into these entirely separate areas where you don't bring together um, different ways of knowing or different fields and etc. We could do a lot better at this, but it, it, we're different for trying, really quite different for trying. Then the second one is spirituality, and I have not found any institutions that are committed to plural spirituality. There are schools that have a religious commitment to a specific, not just religion, but to a denomination. We are committed to the most wide kind of spirituality, Hindu, Buddhist, Taoist, Confucian, uh, Jewish, Christian, Muslim, shamanic, and lots of other varieties that are uh, sort of um, uh, interspersed. That's a very unusual commitment, and especially if it's, if it's done seriously, as I think it is here. We're also committed to cultural diver diversity, um, and uh, this is, and not all these, we're calling them commitments. I think we should call them aspirations, actually, because these are really hard to do. Uh, uh, cultural diversity usually requires a lot of scholarship, because people who have a, an ethnic claim, an ethnic self-identity, can very often get a really good scholarship someplace, and we don't have that kind of fund. So this is hard, but we're working at it. Um, and then there were uh, uh, the uh, multiple ways of knowing. I know we're doing really much better at that than almost anybody else because we do. You know, we pay attention attention to intuition, meditation, and movement, um, uh, the, the source of the body, is a, uh, the body is the source of knowledge, all of that is quite special, special here uh, in our psychology program, trauma therapy, etc. Uh, then we have two ideals that are thrown together. <laughs> this is kind of embarrassing to say, but uh, when we did this, 
I remember I was sort of prominent in the discussion, and we, we couldn't get a, a separate one of the seven for feminism, and we couldn't get a, a separate one for ecology. Imagine, it's incredible, just as Judy was saying, you know, what 68 was like compared to now. Uh, and so they were sort of put together. Some people think they go together, but really they should have their own feminism and ecology, two huge uh, issues in our time. Uh, just, just read the paper, that's all it takes to see these are huge issues. Um, and then community, I, I think we're probably doing pretty well at communities. Most of our students are committed, come here for a certain kind of knowledge and, and, and skill and whatever else, but uh, they, if you ask them what's really great, they mostly will talk about their community, that their friends and their work together and, and, and just building a sense of shared aspirations. It's really valuable, precious. It's very hard to find. Um, the, uh, I think some people graduate from college and say, where's the best place to live? Where do I meet people like me? I know, San Francisco, and they look at CIIS, and they come, and that actually works. Um, and then integral governance is, of course, a big topic, I, I could almost say this week, uh, because of the uh, financial struggles and uh, reconstruction and, and uh, needing to reduce the payroll um, because of a drop in, in income. Uh, and uh, it's everybody thinks they know how they would do it better. Maybe they do, I don't know, but it's very, very hard to do, and it's hard to do it gently because it affects people's lives. Um, so that, that ideal um, integral governance says it, it is an aspiration to at least try to reduce the conflicts that are endemic in almost all institutions, including maybe especially institutions of higher education. It's just people have a big investment in th that, it, that the institution be what they hope it will be and that they, that they want it to be and expect it to be. It's very, very hard. It has to do with money and, and law and, and misunderstandings, communication, all kinds of stuff. If you're really good at this, let us know. We need some help. Um, Okay, so I wanted to just conclude by emphasizing that mission is uh, future oriented. It's what we're trying to do. And spiritual is we are trying to do everything that's important to do as for example, social justice in a way that has depth, that has mystery, that has a numinous quality, a mystery of a kind of the sense of, ah, that's better. That's really, that's deep, that's, that's special. When I took my granddaughter to the Russian cathedral on Geary, we came out, she didn't say anything for a long time. I said, so what do you think? She said, it's really quiet in there. <laughs> it's quiet a lot of places, but it's a different kind of quiet. It's a mysterious quiet. It's ninth or 11th century Russian quiet. Now that's something, that's a sense that we want to offset argument, conflict, uh, struggle by some reverence, some depth, some mystery. William James says at the end of his long, long, long study of religious experience, he says, we're continuous with something more, he doesn't know what it is, through which saving experiences come. That's a spiritual dimension that is more than the social political, but doesn't exclude the social political. Though, to be honest in my concluding remark, I often finish with, start off finish with William James, because with whom I have this internal dialogue. He didn't actually have the social justice gene that we're looking for. Josiah Royce, his younger colleague, had it. John Dewey had it. But together, they had everything. <laughs> but they didn't all, and there's no one of them had everything. All right, and that's what we want. We want more people to come with more gifts, more qualities, more aspirations and um, more willingness to sacrifice their what they're holding to in favor of a larger quality, a larger, a larger good. So we thank Hari Das and Bina, and we thank their their family. Thank you. Oh, we always I could always count if I've got to talk about something on this topic. Oh, I hope they come. Thank you. <laughs> but a little bit of uh, you know uh, support. Thank you, Mark. Thank you all, and thank you for coming. <laughs>